Okay, can you see that now? Okay, can you see that now? Yes, Professor. How's that? Mm, it's fine. Is that good? It's good, Professor. You can start your presentation now. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Okay. <clears throat> well, I used to be at MIT in Massachusetts and uh, I retired from there four years ago but I took up another position at the University of California at Riverside. And I have a one third appointment there, but I have four postdocs, three or four postdocs, and here are four of them about whose work I, I wanna talk about today. The title has changed and uh, because it's been some time since I provided the first title, but the title is how to make olefin metathesis catalysts from olefins. So the olefin metathesis or alkene metathesis reaction is now 60 years old. So it's an old reaction. I spent my life studying the reaction uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, but I wanna tell you about something new and surprisingly uh, it is about how these catalysts are formed from simple quote catalysts unquote uh, like metal oxides on silicate or alumina. So the reaction is shown here in the middle of the screen. I think everybody has probably heard of it. Uh, the mechanism is proven more or less as much as you can prove a mechanism and was first proposed by Yves Chauvin in 1971. So as I said, I've spent my, my life making catalysts for this reaction. And they have to have a metal carbon double bond. And I discovered that high oxidation state or D0 formally uh, complexes of molybdenum and tungsten with four coordinate geometry can be made that have this metal carbon bond in them and do perform this, this metathesis reaction. And here are some of them in the periods of time in which they were developed in the past. The crucial intermediate in this reaction, as I showed on the first slide, is a metallocyclobutane. So a metallocyclobutane can break up loose olefin to make a metal carbon double bond from either one side of the metallocyclobutane, shown here on the left, or the other side. So this is a, a metallocycle made from ethylene and a methylene complex and is one of the many possible intermediates in a metathesis reaction, but it has to be this trigonal bipyramidal shape. Uh, it cannot be a square pyramidal shape, such as shown on the right here. This is an actual crystal structure of a substituted metallocyclobutane because this particular one and many others, depending on what ligands are around the metal, cannot convert to the required trigonal bipyramidal shape that is required for losing olefin. So these five coordinate compounds of this type can interconvert sometimes quickly, sometimes not. And if they don't interconvert quickly, then, and then it can get stuck, so to speak, in this uh, relatively unreactive um, complex on the right of the square pyramidal form. The crucial feature of the trigonal bipyramid that works is shown on, on the left in a schematic form. We're looking down on top of the, the, the ring here from the top. 
And there is an empty orbital, an unused d orbital that is sitting in the plane of the ring and is oriented as, as shown here. And that is the, the transportation, so to speak, of electrons from this bond into the metal carbon bond to make a double bond and from the metal carbon bond to make a carbon carbon bond and make the, the crucial intermediate, the one that contains this loosely bound, loosely bound uh, olefin methylene in this case. This was reported uh, a long time ago, but was very nicely uh, summarized in a paper here by uh, Odile Eisenstein and Christophe Coppere, including uh, a lot of theoretical studies. So nobody knows how alkylidines are formed from olefins. The one I showed you, the ones I showed you, are showed by alpha abstraction reactions in which a, a dialkyl donates one of its alpha protons to a neighboring alkyl to give alkane and make the metal carbon double bond. And thousands of those reactions are known, but nobody really knew up until a few months ago, frankly, uh, how olefins are uh, used to make alkylidines directly. And here are some of the, the possible uh, mechanisms for that reaction. Uh, the one at the top is just there's, a, there's some H. It could be a proton, it could be a hydride, it could be an H from a carbon hydrogen activation in a ligand that reacts with an olefin at one carbon or the other one carbon to give this product, this alkyl product, or the other carbon to give this one uh, to make an alkyl. And then uh, that H is removed from the opposite carbon to make either a, a terminal alkylidine shown here to the right, uh, or a disubstituted alkylidine shown here uh, on the right, lower right. So that was one there was some evidence for, for that type of reaction for tantalum, but not for tungsten or molybdenum. Another possibility is a ring contraction reaction. This is some chemistry of tantalum. Tantalum is, of course, right next door to uh, tungsten, group six, um, uh, proceeding via a metallocyclopentane ring, which goes to perhaps an alkenal hydride and the H ends up on the CH2 to make a methyl substituted metallocyclobutane ring, which is a metathesis active compound and loses methylene or propylene, propylene in this case in the presence of methylene, then yields a metallocyclobutane. There's another reaction here, a CH activation, allylic CH activation that converts uh, in theory a an olefin to a metallocyclobutane. This is a proposal by Christoph Coppere. So let's look at the first one here. We found about a year ago now that we could interconvert a styrene complex with a disubstituted alkylidine complex readily with a proton. So the H in this case is a proton. Believe it or not, this was the first time that anybody had showed that that was possible. So this is the acid dimethyl anilinium BARF, where the BARF is a relatively non-coordinating anion. We'll add to the CH2 group to make an, an alkyl uh, cation. And then um, from that CH2 group, uh, well, sorry, so yeah, let's do it this way. Uh, the proton will add to the CH2 group to give the alkyl cation. And then from that alkyl cation, uh, the proton in the beta position can be removed to remake the styrene complex or from the alpha position to make the disubstituted alkylidine. So this is the intermediate going either one way or the other and establishing this equilibrium, which is uh, surprisingly easy to do, although it is slow, but it's a very special type of reaction. And this is a very special kind of intermediate, a very unusual 
molybdenum-6, a crowded secondary alkyl with both beta proton-3 and an alpha proton. And it's found that the alpha proton is actually removed about 30 times faster than the beta proton, uh, which is a big surprise, but it leads to about an equilibrium mixture, about a two to one equilibrium mixture of the two species. So the olefin that we chose and the alkylidine are not too far apart in energy. That was actually the first time that it was established that olefins and alkylidine analogous complexes are really about the same energy. So we published this in 2021, and these were the first interconversions, uh, as I mentioned. So the second one in the list there is an obscure reaction called the ring contraction reaction. This was discovered by Steve McLean and my group a long time ago, before probably any of you were born. Uh, and what it is, is it arose from a study of metallocyclopentanes of tantalum. And these were made from olefins clicking together around a tantalum D2 species to give a tantalum 5 metallocyclopentane. And then two, what I call beta hydride eliminations. So you eliminate an H from the beta carbon to give an alkenyl hydride and then a re reinsertion or a readdition of the metal H to the double bond to contract the ring. And then it does it again, beta hydride elimination, readdition, boom. It is not a beta hydride elimination reductive elimination, which is not another possibility. These could um, reductively eliminate to give the product, but mechanistic studies showed that surprisingly that was not the case. So this reaction has been sitting around for 60 years. Uh, but I did have the, the idea that, as shown in quotes here, and it's written in this paper, the MC4, this one, to MC3 ring contraction is a straightforward and reasonable way of forming an alkylidine from olefins, assuming that some MC3 complexes, which form in this manner, will cleave to give metathesis products instead of rearranging. So instead of rearranging, this could just split up and give an olefin and an alkylidine, and that is a possible way if you could discover it. Um, molybdenum and tungsten metallocycles would be converted into alkylidines. So we started to look at metallocyclopentane. Surprisingly, there aren't many. There are hundreds of metallocyclobutanes known, which are the crucial intermediates, but metallocyclopentanes were thought to be dead ends, as we call it, in a, rea in a metathesis reaction. They could not be converted back to olefins. How would you possibly do that? Well, one way is ring contraction. So we began to look uh, at metallocyclopentanes in my group in Riverside. And we made one as shown here. This is a diisopropyl phenylamido tungsten complex, triphenyl siloxide, two triphenyl siloxides, metallocyclopentane, it's actually made by a reaction that doesn't involve an alkylidine. It involves a diethyl intermediate, which then makes an ethylene complex, which reacts with added ethylene to give the metallocyclopentane. This is the NMR spectrum of it. Very simple. The surprising thing is all the protons on this ring, 2468, are found here around three parts per million. So this is uh, the isopropyl methine in this imido group, and these are the imido isopropyl methyl groups here. So all the protons in this five coordinate species are in one place because circumstantially is why, but it's also fluxional. So if you go up in temperature from around room temperature, you find that you get two types of protons in this ring. This ring is flipping over. It's flipping over in a berry type or turnstile type process that then interconverts upper protons pointing toward the amido group with lower protons. 
but the alpha and beta protons do not interconvert. So you end up with a set of four protons of one type, alpha, and four protons of another type, beta. And if you cool down the reaction, make sure you get a more complicated uh, pattern in which this ring is then frozen in some, um, um, some way as to lead to a, probably more or less a second order reaction, uh, a second order uh, interaction between the protons. So the way that this ring flips over is just that. You, you take the ring and you move it, you flip the plane by about 90 degrees, and that would give this particular uh, intermediate trigonal bipyramid of one type. In this species, then, there's a mirror plane going through the compound, and that will uh, interconvert upper and lower alpha protons and upper and lower beta protons. But there are four others, three others, four total, that are possible. And these are what I call them. And these are now, if you can't see them, they must be later greater than two kcals higher in energy, but they have to be there because the process passes through either one of them shown here with a mirror plane or this one over here with a mirror plane. The others don't have mirror planes, but they may be part of the uh, fluxional process um, of the Berry pseudo rotation type. But none of these has been observed. Here's the crystal structure of the square pyramidal uh, metallocyclopentane that uh, we've made. And there's nothing surprising about it. It's a classical square pyramid. The tau value is, is, um, is as it should be for a square pyramid. We know uh, of several others of this general type. So I asked the student, Max uh, um, Bougelel, Maxime Bougelel, to simply look at simple reactions, such as exchanging C13, labeled ethylene, into the metallocyclopentane ring. Uh, metallocyclopentanes could, in theory, break up and lose olefin and make a olefin complex. And that is, in fact, what happens when you add another donor you lose ethylene and make a donor ethylene complex. Uh, but if ethylene is the donor, then you can exchange C13 ethylene into the ring. And it does relatively slowly. Under one atmosphere of ethylene, you get the di-labeled metallocyclopentane, and then the labeled completely, the metallocyclopentane labeled completely. But then, uh, and, and you look at the spectrum and, and what you see are alpha protons here in the NMR spectrum around 70 parts per million for the carbon C13 labeled alpha protons. And then here another uh, signal around 35 for the beta pro for the beta carbon atoms in the metallocyclopentane ring. But Max was a good student and he said, well, let's wait and see what happens. So what happens is eventually after six hours, you can clearly see that something else is happening. There's some signals here and over here. And ultimately after five days, slow reaction, room temperature, after five days, you see signals that are characteristic of propylene shown here at the bottom, here, here, and here. The signals for the metallocyclopentane have decreased now here and here. And then there are some broad signals around 22 and around 45. I've given them question marks because we initially didn't know what they were. This reaction, it requires light. So in the dark, the metallocyclopentane is stable at 90 degrees for three days. And this is room light, fluorescent light. Uh, if you take this spectrum and you cool it down, that's typically what you do. If you see some broad peaks, you want to see if there's a fluxional process going on. And indeed there is. Those broad peaks turn out to be 
um, a signal characteristic of an alpha carbon in a metallocyclobutane, square pyramidal metallocyclobutane, this one over here, and a beta carbon, a triplet here at around uh, 23 parts per million. So 23 and 45 parts per million are the metallocyclobutane. And these little doublets here are the starting metallocyclopentane. So this reaction is about 80% complete. If you blow up the spectrum quite a bit, uh, blow off all the other signals so they're, they're out of the picture, you see a couple of peaks that are characteristic of a square pyramidal metallocyclobutane. So as usual, trigonal bipyramids and square pyramidal complexes are pretty close in energy and it so happens they're about two K cows apart in this particular case. The alpha carbon in this butane, sorry, uh, is around 100, very characteristic for uh, carbons in butanes that are trigonal bipyramids. They have a lot of double bond character and metal carbon, short metal carbon bonds and then a beta carbon here at about minus five. And the crystal structure is of the square pyramidal one. The one that crystallizes out is 98% um, uh, present in the mixture and it's the one that crystallizes out. It's a square pyramid, uh, but is metathesis inactive. So if you expose this reaction to 450 nanometer light, which you can get with a strip of LEDs these days, you get the metallocyclobutane formed and propylene in 15 minutes. So this is about 50 times faster than it is in ambient light and it doesn't work in the dark. Uh, now we're starting to do variations and I'll tell you more about the reaction in a minute, but sometimes a black light, lower, um, higher energy, lower uh, wavelength is required. And you can get those too. And when the one we get uses 390 nanometer light, that's sometimes required. Sunlight, of course, has frequencies in the spectrum that can do this reaction. Also, that also works. And the metallocyclobutane and propylene, propylene are the only products. Now, if you carry out the reaction in the absence of ethylene, you get an absolute uh, zoo, as we call it. <laughs> you get approximately 30 labeled carbon signals. Among them, we think signals for the compounds shown here, square pyramidal species only, because those are the ones that are most stable. This is an alpha methyl substituted metallocyclobutane. This has up and down methyl groups. So that's two isomers. There's a beta methyl substituted metallocyclobutane. These are all C3, C4H8 compounds. Uh, here's a propylene complex methyl group up and down. And this is another one that we found in there. It's a metallocyclopentane coming from ethylene and propylene. It's a beta methyl metallocyclopentane methyl group up and down. And then there are some methylene complexes, either a monomer or a dimer. But if you add ethylene to this complicated mixture formed by photolysis in the absence of ethylene, which you would normally throw away because it's so complex and obviously a decomposition, well, all of these compounds are converted to the unsubstituted metallocyclobutane or starting material, metallocyclopentane and propylene. So this is what the LED light envelope looks like for the 450 nanometer light. <coughs> it's about 100, 100 milliwatts. Uh, this uh, tail end of the spectrum is for the metallocyclopentane sample. And you see it, it reaches into it reaches into the absorb the emission spectrum area for the nano, 450 nanometer light between about 420 
uh, and about 450 nanometers or so, but it's a very weak absorption. So it's uh, obviously a forbidden absorption. It's uh, got a lambda max there, uh, a little bit, uh, well, very strong allowed absorption at 260 nanometers, but the one at uh, 380 or so is about a 17,000 epsilon and, and the shoulder of it is even, even less. So it's a very, very weak absorption. And of course we don't know what it's due to. If you reduce the power of the LEDs, cut them from 100% to 75% and to 50%, then you find in this log plot that the rate decreases as it should. And if you take that rate and plot it versus the power input, you actually uh, get a, a response that is a quadratic function. So this is what's called a second order, non-first order uh, reaction, very important in chemistry. Not There are many types, and this is not the type where you need a, a femt of second laser to, to blast the oxidation state uh, that you produce through blasting it with another laser, nothing like that. This is just simple um, two-step photon absorption of some type. And I won't go into it uh, in, in much detail, but one, one question is, uh, what, what is this compound? We don't think it's one that we can see. We don't think it's one that's in the mixture unless it's excited by light, when it's vibrationally excited by light. And then we believe that um, the metallocyclopentane is another type of trigonal bipyramid. We think it's a, uh, well, it's a trigonal bipyramid. It's, it's not a square pyramid. So you set up a conversion of the square pyramid to the trigonal bipyramid with the ring in the equatorial position as found in known metallocyclobutanes up here in the upper left, upper right are square pyramidal versions, distances and angles in square pyramidal metallocyclobutanes. Here are the distances and angles in square pyramidal metallocyclopentanes. And we think the crucial intermediate is a, a trigonal bipyramidal metallocyclopentane of an unknown type that is formed when the compound, the square pyramid is vibrationally excited in which the metal carbon bonds are as in the metallocyclobutanes, quite short and quite prone to form a metallocyclobutane, go from here to there. And that same orbital that does the metathesis reaction in metallocyclobutanes, we believe is responsible or proposed that it's responsible for contracting this ring from five-membered carbon to four-membered carbon. So here's a proposed mechanism, a lot of, a lot of uh, structures drawn, but I'll try to simplify it. So this is the observed metallocyclopentane square pyramid with light. It's excited to, this is one of two possibilities. Let's just say it's this one, excited to this metallocyclopentane with the equatorial metallocyclopentane ring. And it's this one that is photolyzable. It absorbs another photon to cleave the metal carbon bond and yield what uh, I show as a tungsten five with a, a dangling butenal or butane radical. And then an H atom moves from this carbon, which is formerly a beta carbon, to the alpha carbon as the metal carbon bond forms. So all that can happen in, in one shot. Uh, this radical can't get away, it's right there and takes H dot from a neighboring carbon to contract the ring to the alpha methyl metallocyclobutane, which is of the trigonal bipyramidal type and metathesis active. So it can lose propylene. So it can lose propylene, 
go to the methylene that takes up ethylene, forms the trigonal bipyramidal methylcyclobutane, which then relaxes to the observed product, the square pyramidal methylcyclobutane. If this just formed intermediate relaxes to the square pyramid, then you would get an alpha methyl methylcyclobutane. That was one proposed in this mixture uh, in the absence of ethylene. And that compound cannot convert to the beta methyl methylcyclobutane because it's metathesis inactive. It has to go back, make the methylene and absorb propylene in another way to give this one. Okay, it's complicated. What did the key, the key step here is a collapse of this ring to the alpha methyl methylcyclobutane, and you have to move H from a beta carbon to one of the alpha carbons to do that. This is could be called an alpha uh, or beta H abstraction by a radical. It be, could, could be called a one, two hydrogen atom shift, could be called a beta H reinsertion into a metal carbon double bond. Whatever it is, that's the key feature of this reaction. So we started to look at variations. One of them is this triphenyl methyl imido variation. Triphenyl methyl is called tritile. It has a, a stable, fairly stable radical. The tritile radical forms Gomberg's dimer. Uh, it's a, a triphenyl, uh, fairly stable cation. It's not used in chemistry, organometallic or inorganic chemistry very much because it was, I guess, thought that the nitrogen carbon bond would cleave readily and form either the tritile radical or the carbonium ion, but it doesn't. For various reasons I won't go into, we chose that imido group. We made the metallocyclopentane. Uh, we photolyzed the metallocyclopentane. We found that it does get converted to the metallocyclobutane and propylene. But when you look at, you follow that reaction, you find that the rate of consumption of the metallocyclopentane shown here in uh, the plot, just direct um, data, is about uh, one half the rate of consumption of the metallocyclopentane for the diisopropylphenoamido ligand system. I'm going to get up and just uh, close the blinds here a bit. Be right back. Okay, um, and then the, um, the rate of formation of product, the metallocyclobutane, is very slow. It's about 1 20th the rate of the consumption of the metallocyclopentane in the diisopropylphenolamidal system. And in order to end up in that situation, there's an intermediate formed. So here's the intermediate rises up, goes back down. And the rate of loss of that intermediate is about 0.12 times 10 to the minus three. And the rate of um, formation of product is then cut down by a factor of about 10 and one half and one tenth. So it's 1 20th overall to yield the product, this, this metallocyclobutane. And the reaction is the same. The reasons why it's so much slower, there are many possible reasons, and I don't have time to go into it, and we don't know the answer anyway. But uh, here we are with the same reaction. You generate this crucial intermediate metallocyclobutane. Uh, the ring gets contracted from a, from a 
metallocyclopentane to an alpha methyl metallocyclobutane of the TBT type. And then in this case, uh, propylene is not lost readily and it collapses to an observable square pyramidal methyl metallocyclobutane. And eventually this does lose propylene, but it has to go back to the TPP to do so. It does that fairly slowly and does give the methylene, which then absorbs ethylene and gives the final product. So this is not yet, excuse me, this is not yet isolated. Uh, it's uh, identified in the mixture through NMRCH correlations. And it does go to the beta methyl metallocyclobutane eventually uh, through formation of the methylene and readdition of propylene. But that's uh, very slow, but it is um, uh, the favored product, the beta methyl version. So what about other alkoxides? And of course we have molybdenum and we have many amido groups, we have oxo groups, we have many alkoxides. So we're involved in a, in a rather uh, complicated uh, detective story here. When does this reaction happen? And when does it not happen and why? So in the tritylamido bistibutoxide metallocyclopentane case, which we've made, you put that in the reactor, 450 nanometer light, no reaction. So we had some reasons why that might be true, but uh, I said, well, why don't we just try some higher energy light? Not too much higher energy. We don't want to blow the whole thing apart. So let's just try some what is called black light, the purple light, 390 nanometer. That does contract the ring. Now you have to keep in mind that we're taking ethylene and we're making propylene. Ethylene is converted to propylene on the scale of 100 million tons per year using a process that is one of the most ancient metathesis processes out there, tungsten oxide on silica with some magnesium uh, oxide, I think, as, as a co-supporter. So um, it is an important reaction, uh, but it's run at 400 degrees centigrade, and uh, there are lots of reasons to improve it. These are ethylene to propylene reactions but they're done under fairly mild conditions and they're not metathesis reactions. They're really anti-metathesis reactions in a way. Okay, so bis butoxide worked, but you need more energy. A bis trifluor butoxide complex also contracts with either light, but a biphenoxide complex, two linked phenoxide ligands, a bis phenoxide, unlinking the two ligands, or a hexafluorotibutoxide, this hexafluorotibutoxide system does not work with either light. Now, there are lots of reasons we're still, that you should consider that we're still deeply involved in that and will be for some years if I am able to, to carry on. So, it's um, gratifying to say the least that this ring contraction that we proposed in 1979 turns out to be 43 laters, 43 years later, uh, a way to make alkylidines from ethylene. So this connects that proposal in 1979 with metathesis for the first time. It establishes ring closing. This is the first time that anybody's seen these ring closing reactions. And importantly, leads us to suspect that even ambient visible light can play a role in metathesis reactions, which nobody has ever proposed or observed before. I think it's possible that molybdenum and tungsten metallocyclopentanes can do this contraction reaction thermally. And I think even substituted versions of these metallocycles can contract in the absence of light, that is, do it thermally. So this is, I think, 
although it's not conclusive, an answer to the question as to how do you make alkylidines from olefins? Okay, you can add a proton as I showed, but you know, acids and bases, they can be around certainly, but um, it's a more complex reaction and probably not a general reaction. We now know that at least for ethylene, and I think other olefins, as we observe for tantalum, rings can contract and you can make metallocycobutanes and therefore you can make methylenes and metathesized olefins. And the question is then, what about this third proposal that I put up on the board or the screen? What about CH activation in propylene to give an allyl hydride? And if the H moves to the central carbon, then a metallocyclobutane. But we've been playing with propylene complexes and we've never seen this. And in fact, we found that you can take these metallocyclobutanes that we've been making and add a Lewis acid and convert or rearrange them to propylene. So this reaction goes the other way. It doesn't go this way. It goes that way via, we think, a cationic allele intermediate. So you remove hydride, give it to some external Lewis acid, and then uh, add it back to yield propylene, which is uh, the, probably the more stable of the two. It goes to, it goes to completion, 100% completion. So clearly it's the more stable product in this particular case. Um, and this is therefore probably not a general way to make metallocycobutanes from olefins, but we'll see. We think that the ring contraction may turn out to be the answer to the question in the absence of acids and bases. So um, I want to thank all the students that took part, did all this work, and uh, thank you for your attention. And I I uh, do have positions at Riverside, so if anybody wants an interesting postdoc to figure out this incredibly um, complicated process, I'd be happy to look at their application. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that insightful talk, Professor. Now the stage is open for questions. Hello, everyone. Please unmute your mic and you can ask your queries to Professor. Uh, Professor Shaw, it was a wonderful talk. This is uh, Prasenji P. Ghosh from uh, Mumbai. Uh, 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 so I have a question for you. Uh, is uh, uh, olefin metathesis catalyst developed for chromium or it is something which is only restricted to ruthenium, uh, 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 like tungsten? So what the question is, are there other metathesis catalysts that will do this? For chromium, yeah, I mean for chromium. Yeah, well, we know very little at this point. Uh, we're pretty sure that molybdenum will do it. Uh, the only other metathesis re, uh, catalysts are, of course, ruthenium, which is a much different D4 uh, type complex. Uh, and now there are some vanadium uh, catalysts that oh. seem to mimic uh, molybdenum. But in general, uh, metallocyclopentanes, I think, of the ruthenium type, analogous ones, are unknown. Oh. And for vanadium, I think they're unknown. And they're currently known metallocyclopentanes only for molybdenum or tungsten. So um, I think it may turn out to be a unique reaction for molybdenum and tungsten, yes. but we shall see. Did I answer your question? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Actually, uh, I had uh, heard you at Columbia University, I was a student in 
93 or 94, uh, you visited our department and uh, I, I worked for Jet, Jet Parking. Uh, so I heard you at Columbia uh, that time. So this is the second time I'm hearing you. Was there a question in there? No, no, no. Okay, <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you for your interest. I think it's one of the most exciting reactions I've ever done. And I've, I've done some pretty exciting reactions. So um, uh, it's nice to have closure in terms of metathesis uh, that uh, when I started out my career a long time ago, 